Hello there. I'm Terry Sawchuk from Sawchuk Wealth. Today is Tuesday, July 26th. This is uh, the latest iteration of the In the Lion's Den podcast. Want to uh, just go over a, a market summary. There's so much going on right now. This is a super busy week as far as economic data. Today, Tuesday, the FOMC meeting begins. We're expecting to uh, see about at least a 0.75% rate hike out of the Fed for the federal funds rate, short-term interest rates. But we're also gonna get some commentary around the way they're seeing the world. Inflation is still high, and we expect that they're gonna remain hawkish. On Thursday, we get the next print of gross domestic product for the second quarter. It's expected to be negative. I find it deeply hilarious that the Biden administration is now telling us that for the first time in history, two consecutive quarters of negative GDP does not constitute a recession. It's like, they think we're dumb. They're just gonna change the rules and we're gonna believe anything that they say. And they're out there just trying to blame everybody for everything except themselves. And now granted, some of what we're dealing with, maybe a lot of what we're dealing with, it has less to do with them, but there's a lot of just stupid policy mistakes that have gone on. Just bad economic policy, bad political ideology, bad energy policy. I mean, I mean, just on and on and on. So they have no one to blame but themselves. And based on the data that I'm seeing, it's not good. Okay, a lot of the leading indicators are rolling over. And I've been saying this, but they got a little bit better and now they're trending down more significantly. We have yet to see the real impact of the higher energy prices and really the energy shortage in Europe, frankly, because the weather's been warm. But as the weather turns and it gets colder in Europe, you're gonna see the impact of the lack of energy, the cost of energy, the inputs on production, the disruptions in supply chain potentially. I mean, there's a lot that's gonna happen just related to that alone. But if we kind of pull it back and just talk about where we're at right now, we had a little bounce in the S&P 500. Actually, if you look at this chart, you can see that if we just go back from the middle of June, we kind of bottomed out. We had a little, what I'd call a cyclical bull market bounce in a, in a larger bear market. And if you look at the market structure, you can see that we kind of peaked back in January. Then we went down, we had a high, but as you can see, it was a lower high, followed by another leg down, which was lower than the previous low, followed by another little push up, which was lower than the previous push up. Then we had another lower low. We had a little cyclical top here, and it looks as though we're kind of starting that next leg down. And the question is gonna be, are we gonna hold this 3,600 roughly level on the S&P 500, or are we gonna to break to new lows? Just looking at the chart, the momentum doesn't look good. We, we've got a little red dot here. That is uh, an indication that VWAP, volume weighted average price, is moving down again, and it just crossed from positive to negative. And so I would expect this momentum wave to continue to go down. This red blob here are what we call money flows. And they started to trend up, but it looks like that's turning back down now. So on a really short-term basis, it's looking a lot more bearish. And of course, it's lining up exactly with this super busy week of data that's coming out. So I want to go over to a chart from 42 Macro. Darius Dale is the founder and CEO of 42 Macro. Super smart guy. I rely on his service for a fair amount of data. And just about by every measure, if you look at these dotted lines, whether it's the financial conditions index, whether it's earnings yields on the S&P 500, credit spreads, or the uh, ratio of what we'll call bearish to bullish stocks or defensive to growth stocks. I mean, by every measure, we're below any level where we've seen a re recession, which just means that we're not there yet, okay? So the market has not priced a recession into where it's at today, which means there's very likely another leg down. The only one that's even in the ballpark is this uh, credit spreads, and it's kind of where it was at the mildest of the recessions that he's tracking here. So the bottom line is, by almost every measure, the market has not yet priced in a recession, 
But it's obvious this week it will be announced that we're in a technical recession, okay? And that just means two straight quarters of negative GDP growth. Now, we haven't really started the earnings recession yet, which I think is gonna happen in earnest in the next few months. And everything right now is contingent on what the Fed does here. So I'm gonna go to the next chart. And uh, again, when you look at the data, you can clearly see that peak to trough, okay, the market on the leading indicator side of things has not priced in a recession. We're currently 27% off the peak, but in the previous recessions, it was 80, 66, and 80 in terms of percentages of peak to trough in these leading indicators. We're just not there yet. And then lastly, oops, going the wrong way here. If you look at this chart, it clearly shows that a lot of times the market will bottom anywhere from one month before the economy bottoms to as long as 21 months to the bottom of the bear market. So we've got a long way to go, okay? And I'm gonna get away from this. I'm gonna go back to the markets and let's go to this chart. Uh, I wanna go and wanna talk about the U.S. Treasury yields, okay? Currently, the U.S. 10-year Treasury is at 2.76%. The two-year Treasury is at 3.01%. So effectively, the two-year Treasury is paying 0.25% more than a 10-year Treasury, okay? And so what does that mean? It means that we have an inverted yield curve and it's a precursor to a recession. It's, it's been very accurate in predicting recessions. Now, the interesting thing is that historically, the recession comes 18 to 24 months after we get the inverted yield curve. But in my view, things are moving so much faster now that I doubt it's gonna take that long. And we're gonna get the print Thursday that tells us, that confirms that effectively we've got two consecutive quarters of negative growth. So by technical definition, we're already there. Again, we don't have the earnings recession and we haven't started to get the really significant job losses and some of the other things that normally go with a recession. So it's pretty clear that the worst is yet to come. But it's also clear that the yield curve is telling us that we're moving in that direction. Uh, the dollar has been strengthening and it got to 109, this is the DXY, which just a, it's a measure of dollar strength right against the basket of other currencies. It'll be interesting to see how this plays out. I think it's probably getting to the upper end of the range, but if this continues to strengthen, it's considered kind of tongue in cheek, a wrecking ball, because the stronger the dollar gets, the more difficult it becomes for the rest of the world because they trade in dollars and their currencies are weakening and it's not very helpful. It, it screws up trade. It makes trade for other countries, especially the emerging markets, much more complicated and expensive and it's bad for their economy. So, you know, some dollar strength is probably okay, but this much dollar strength is not. And so what this really means, okay, I'm gonna bounce around a little bit, but you know, the bottom line is this, is that everything hinges on the combination of monetary and fiscal, but probably right now, almost exclusively monetary policy. And there are some people that are in the camp that the Fed is likely to pivot sooner rather than later. What, what I mean by pivot is just to kind of go away from tightening to a minimum of neutral and maybe even back to easing, okay? And they're really stuck between a rock and a hard place. This is years, if not decades in the making. So we are in a new environment and it's gonna be very, very difficult to time the markets and ultimately to pick trends. And so cash is king right now. And from that standpoint, at my firm, we started raising, raising cash back in January, actually January 24th, and we've been you know, raising cash since. And we're now to the point where we're basically 65 to 70% in cash in all of our portfolios. And we had this little bounce, but we're not done yet. So we think there's another leg down. And so the bottom line is, this is not a time to be taking a lot of risk. If anything, it's a time to be more defensive. The Fed has a big problem on their hands because they can't let interest rates get too much higher because as the older treasuries roll over to new treasuries, the new treasuries are much more expensive because interest rates are higher. 
which means the percentage of the U.S. budget that's devoted to debt service goes up dramatically. And so this is why I think there are a number of people that, that are you know, pretty adamant that the Fed's going to pivot. The problem is that they're still dealing with pretty significant inflation. And in my view, based on the way the world has evolved over the last, let's say, three or four years, it's become clear that the Fed is, it's a political machine. And what I mean by that is, they're not this neutral independent body that they're supposed to be. And like most of Washington, D.C., you know, and this is not about ideology in the sense that, you know, it doesn't matter what I think in terms of my own personal ideology. This is just a fact is that the Fed and most of Washington, D.C. leans to the left. So why is that important? Because they're going to want to do something prior to the elections because they really don't want a Republican landslide. OK, they don't. And they may be dying a death by a thousand cuts here. It's either you get hit by a bus and you're dead instantaneously, or you know, you've got some disease that protracts over a period of months or even years, but either one is terminal. And I think that's to some degree where they're at with the elections because they're either gonna deal with you know rampant inflation, which people don't like for obvious reasons, or they're gonna deal with a terrible economy where asset prices are down another 20, 30, even 40% from here. Real estate prices are down. People are losing their jobs and the economy's in shambles. Those are their two choices. They're stuck in between the two. And so on a short-term basis, is the Fed going to pivot? My gut tells me probably not. I think that the Fed has got some tools available to them. And so they might try to address liquidity in the treasury market through certain vehicles that they have while still maintaining higher interest rates. And so uh, I think the market might be in for a little bit of a rude awakening in a sense that rates will continue to go up, but the, the liquidity issues might get solved. And if that's the case, market expectations for this Fed running to the rescue and dumping all this you know, liquidity and QE back into the system, they might be really, really disappointed. I think it's going to take a lot for the Fed to pivot. And, and I think they're trying to buy some time. And what they'll probably do is kind of try to really change the tone within two or three weeks of the election. And so between now and then, it's just not good, okay? Um, if you look at the charts, if I go back to the S&P 500, and let me just, I'm gonna get rid of this FIB chart and I'm gonna create a slightly bigger one here. Can I delete this? There we go. And I'm gonna go back to my favorite one and, and what I'm concerned about, okay? Is that if you look at the Fibonacci retracement, basically from the low to the high here, okay, we are at the 0 0.382. And you can see that, um, that we've had a lot of action on this 0 0.382. And generally speaking, if you keep touching a line, more than likely you're gonna break through it. And so the fact that we've been really playing around with this 382, which is essentially around 3,800 on the S&P, I think the next leg, if this doesn't hold, and I'd be inclined to think that it probably won't, you know, now we're talking about 3,500 is the 0.5. And realistically, the golden pocket is where markets tend to wanna to get to, which again, I've said all along is around 3,200. And if you look at the 200 week moving average on the S&P, it's right around 3,500. So, you know, that kind of coordinates with the 0.50. So I think we're, we're gonna go at some point and test that. And I would not be surprised to get all the way down to 3,200, okay? So what, but I want you to see a couple things, all right? So I wanna, I'm gonna take you to ARC, okay? And the reason that I'm showing you this, this is a high tech fund, okay? A lot of growth, you know, technology companies, innovative things like battery technology and artificial intelligence and all kinds of stuff, okay? And you can see that from the bottom in COVID to the top, we've gone all the way back to the bottom in ARC. So basically all of the gains that were made post COVID have since been more or less relinquished, okay? Now, if we look at, um, let's go to Bitcoin for a second. And it's not all that different. Bitcoin at the at the very bottom in COVID, if I get to, yeah, March, 
was around four, call it 4,000. This is a little less than that, but call it 4,000. Okay. It got all the way up to 70,000 and Bitcoin is now, at, let's call it 20,000. It's given up the majority of its gains. So if you look at, it blew through the 0.618, got to the 0.786 and theoretically could get all the way back to one. Okay. It's possible for Bitcoin to give up more gains, you know, more of the gains here. And, and we'll see, because with Bitcoin, the reason I'm talking about Bitcoin has just been a bit of a leading indicator, right? I'm not telling anybody to buy Bitcoin. I wouldn't touch crypto right now with a 10 foot pole. As an advisor, we can't even have crypto in our portfolios because it's not regulated. And there are a lot of significant regulatory issues that are facing the crypto industry right now in these stable coins. And the other problem that crypto has at least for, um, I think, some of the tokens is that the SEC views them as unregistered securities. And so that's a, that's a potential regulatory problem. Coinbase is under investigation now for that. And so I think um, until that stuff clears up and the macro picture gets better, it's just not very bullish for crypto at all. But having said that, the reason that I'm pointing out both ARK and Bitcoin is that I don't think it's inconceivable for the markets to give back nearly all of the gains that they have made since COVID. And if you go back on the S&P, that goes all the way down to 2,200 roughly. I don't know that we'll get that low, but it's not off the table, okay? I don't, it's not my base case. It's not even, you know, I, I think it's a low probability outcome for the S&P. I think for the NASDAQ, you know, NASDAQ's seen some more damage here. And so, you know, if you just put that in context, if you get to the 0.618 on NASDAQ, it's now 10,000, okay? And if we go back to where we were at the beginning of COVID, it's more like 6,000. And you have to kind of take a step back and look at what happened here, right? And so from the bottom of COVID, the reason that the markets recovered so dramatically is because we pumped six to $7 trillion worth of stimulus into the markets by way of both monetary and fiscal policy. And that money's gone. And now the Fed is removing liquidity from the system. And I could go into a long discussion about how all that's playing out and why we're only in the early innings of all that right now. But the point is, absent all of the stimulus, you wonder what's gonna drive prices back up. And with what's going on in Ukraine, and again, that's a whole nother issue, um, it, in my view, what's going on in Ukraine, and I've said this, if you, if you listen to my podcast or watch any of my previous videos, I have addressed this issue in that I don't think what's going on in Ukraine is really very much to do with Ukraine at all. I think it has much more to do with Russia, China, Brazil, India, probably Saudi Arabia and other countries wanting to get off the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency. And by the way, this is happening right now. OK, this is not speculation. They are already working on this. I mean, just to put this into perspective, both Russia and China started divesting themselves of U.S. treasuries in the year 2014. OK, so this is not something that they just haphazardly decided to do this year. This has been strategically planned for a while. And I'm quite certain that they were very happy to see Trump gone because this would have been much less likely to happen under Trump's watch for a million different reasons. And so this should tell you something. But if you look at who Russia and China want you to vote for, right now it's Democrats. They want you to vote for this bullshit woke ideology. It's nonsense. It's destroying the fabric of America. And it's not, look, it's not just the Democrats. There's a bunch of idiot Republicans that are doing this too. And look, the political apparatus knows that the average American is easily brainwashed, you know, whether it's through social media companies, traditional media companies, et cetera. But it's clear, and frankly, it's been true so far, they can get the public to buy any bullshit that they want them to. I mean, you're looking at all this stuff now related to COVID and we're finding out that they manufactured a bunch of data and information. You know, Deborah Burks just came out and said that they overplayed the vaccine hand, shocking. Now they're, they're showing most of the deaths are coming from people and, and serious hospitalizations are coming from people that have been vaccinated multiple times, right? So it's just on and on and on. And the telltale, the giveaway, is that they're moving the goalpost now on this recession talk. Forever, the technical definition of a recession has been 
two consecutive quarters of negative GDP. That's a fact. It's like they've got the misinformation bureau out there now trying to label this two consecutive quarters of negative GDP as a recession, as misinformation. Like uh, Yellen's been out there talking like this. Biden's been tweeting about it or whoever's tweeting for him now. And it's utter bullshit. It is absolutely not true. But they know that they control the media machine so they can get people to believe whatever they want. And I promise you, when you start looking at social media, there's going to be all kinds of idiots out there telling us that two quarters of negative GDP isn't a recession. Bullshit. It absolutely is. Now, is it a steep recession? Is it a long lasting recession? Is it any of that stuff? Who knows? Okay. But, you know, we're in the early stages of this, of course, based on everything that I'm looking at right now. But the bottom line is, is that there's just a bunch of propaganda that's not true. And I think what's going on with Russia is a longer term strategic play to kind of use the United States' debt against it as a weapon in sort of a Cold War style, non kinetic conflict. And there's more. There's more coming. And, and so anyone who thought Russia was going to be in and out quickly or anyone who thought that Russia thought that they were going to be in and out quickly doesn't know their ass from a hole in the ground. That was never the case. OK, Russia is in this for the long term because this for them, this is not about Ukraine. It's not about expanding the Soviet Union or any of that nonsense. OK, what it's really about is creating a different economic system, one that is better for them and other countries. And they're already starting to trade for energy in either Russian rubles or Chinese yuan or whatever this new potential basket of currencies might be. Um, certainly gold might be a, might play a role. Who knows? Even certain cryptocurrencies might play a role in their new basket. And you know, it doesn't matter what it is right now. You just have to understand that this is the direction. This is the end of the financial system as you know it. And we're going to a new financial system. This doesn't mean the United States is going to come collapsing down. It just means that we're going to lose some of the privilege that goes along with the world's reserve currency. And we're going to deal with some challenges related to our debt. You know, currently we are, by conservative estimates, our national debt is 120% of GDP. You know, if we start shrinking GDP, then that number will get bigger. And the only way in the long term out of this is to create more, more inflation and then ultimately deflation and devalue the currency. And I think that's what's going to happen. And in the end, what we're going to find is that the Federal Reserve is the buyer of last resort. They are going to end up very likely buying the majority, if not all, of our debt. OK, and that has profound implications. Now, that might be good for asset prices in the short term if that starts to happen. But in the long run, it's going to present some really big challenges. And, you know, we don't even know what that's going to look like yet. Bottom line is this, all right? We're pretty bearish on the short to intermediate term. Everything is based on what the Fed does. I just can't see a scenario where the Fed pivots, you know, before September. And September is an outlier. It's probably going to be November at the earliest, okay? So we've got a long way to go. Cash is king. At this point, we're going to sit on our hands. Cash is an investment, and it's holding up really, really well. Across the board, our portfolios are down on average somewhere between 10 and 12 percent. And I'm really comfortable with that because as the market falls further, the gap between how badly the markets will fall versus how much less we've fallen will just widen out because we've got basically 60 to 70, if not more percent of our money in cash. And when the bottom comes, we're going to have amazing valuations because this is typically what happens. Things go too far in both directions. They go too far up and then they go too far down and then they go back too far up. And so, you know, we're, we're really licking our chops in terms of, you know, the valuations that we think we're going to find. But there's going to be some pain between now and then. And we're just not going to participate by having so much money in cash. We've really insulated ourselves and put ourselves in a really, really good position to not only avoid a lot of the loss, but to really, really make up a lot of ground quickly when the market recovers. And it ultimately will. It ultimately does. So with that said, um, thanks for listening to the podcast this week. Um, I've got a special guest coming in a couple of weeks that I'm really excited about. Not financial, golf related. So next podcast is going to be a relatively famous person that um, has a, uh, a device that a lot of tour pros are using and is designed to help any level of golfer swing the golf club faster. So if you're interested in more distance, check out the next podcast. With that, thanks for listening, and uh, we look forward to, uh, to chatting with you soon.